I've been fascinated by weather and climate for really as long as I can remember. Growing up near Boston, I used to feel a deep sense of wonder every time there was a snowstorm. And now, while my love for snow has melted, my obsession with climate has only deepened, along with a few other obsessions like air quality and geography. So here's the thing. I've noticed that even very intelligent people do not really understand the climate beyond where they've lived. And they might think they do, but they really don't. Oh, I mean everyone but you, by the way. You understand. So that's why I created some unique maps. These are packed with insights I don't think you'll find anywhere else. They could help you figure out the next place you wanna move, vacation, or how to improve your home's indoor environment. I'm Alex and welcome to Healthy Home Guide. I believe everyone deserves fresh, clean air, whether you own or rent. I share practical evidence-based protocols to improve indoor air quality and to help you create a home that only supports your health, never detracts from it. Okay, so today I wanna show you something really cool. I got my hands on some of the most comprehensive climate data out there. The ASHRAE Climatic Design Conditions dataset from 21, which is the most recent version. It contains 30 years of data for over 9,000 locations worldwide and is used by HVAC engineers to size heating and cooling systems, so it has to be high quality. Its website is amazing, but limited in that you can only see data for one location at a time. This is an issue I found with a lot of other resources as well. How am I supposed to contextualize the data? I wanted to see all the data at once, so I emailed the site contact. A Dmitry Ugriamov responded and hooked me up with a file containing all the raw data I asked for. Thank you, Dimitri, for being so immensely helpful. So once I had the raw data, how did I make these maps? Well, long story short, I used Python to analyze the data and then Folium to create interactive maps and charts. Then I created a website so you guys can access them yourself. Yes, now I have a website. It's healthyhomeguide.com, linked in the description. Here's the first map, which shows how humid each location gets. The darker color is less humid and the lighter color is more humid. So let me tell you what's so special about this map. First of all, it uses dew point instead of relative humidity. Relative humidity is an incredibly misleading way to assess the amount of moisture in the air. If you'd like to hear why, check out this video in the description. So before we go further, let's quickly review the dew point scale. 30 Fahrenheit is very dry. 40 is dry, 50 is comfortable, 60 is a little bit humid, 70 is oppressively humid, and 80 plus is inhumane. The second great thing about this map is that what it tells you is practical. It tells you if and when it gets humid, how humid does it get? Each location on the map shows what's called the 1% dew point, which represents the outdoor dew point exceeded during the most humid 1% of hours in a year. So like I said, when it gets humid, how humid is it? In general, it's a much more informative metric than average humidity. All right, now let's get to the fun part. So there was a recent trend where people from the UK and the US were fighting over who has the most brutal heat waves. So a huge part of what makes a heat wave so brutal is the humidity. And as you can see, look at how much more humid most of the US gets than the UK. Look, dark purple UK, so much brighter US. And of course the US has a lot of variation too. There's a lot of drier places in the US too. But I mean, check this out, like 1% dew point of 78 Fahrenheit, even the North is 70 Fahrenheit. UK is around 60 Fahrenheit, 60.8, 60.9, look at that. So the US wins by a landslide or, or loses, I should say. We'll go over temperature in a bit, so stay tuned. Next, a notably humid place relative to the rest of Europe is Italy. We have 1% dew points of 78, 77. That's approaching inhumanely humid. So the most humid places in the world include the UAE, 82, inhumanely humid. Northern India is also extremely humid. Central China, Japan is very humid. See, Japan is actually similarly humid to the Southern US. Fun fact. Let's look at the contiguous US, for which I created separately colorized maps to really see the regional differences. The first thing that's obvious is that there's a clear boundary down the center of the US. That moisture line map I've shown you guys in previous videos is very real. The east gets more humid and the west gets less humid. One fascinating exception to that rule is actually Arizona and Southern California. Look at Phoenix with a 1% dew point of around 72, 70, that's oppressively humid. 
Palm Springs, California, 70. In July, August, and September, it can get really humid in these places. But virtually the entire eastern portion of the U.S. gets oppressively humid, with the coasts and the south being the worst. Vermont, a state that people think is so cool and comfortable in the summer, actually gets very humid, almost 70, oppressive. Massachusetts, where I grew up, 72, also oppressive. Moving south, starting at around Virginia, we start to get in the upper 70s, which is approaching inhumanely humid. And along the Gulf Coast, it can get up to 80. Let's move to the marine region of the West, which has low to moderate humidity. People have this misconception that because areas like Portland and Seattle can be rainy at times, that that means they're humid. So Portland is around 61, and Seattle is around 60. And that, my friends, is a similar 1% dew point to Albuquerque, New Mexico, 60. So when Albuquerque and Seattle get their most humid during summer, they reach similar levels. Okay, so if you're saying no way at this point, listen, I'm not saying that Albuquerque and Seattle have the same average annual dew point. Albuquerque is drier than Seattle on average, but I don't care as much about the average here because it includes cooler seasons where humidity isn't a big concern. So I wanna know how humid it gets during humid seasons. Okay, I'm gonna keep blowing your mind. Las Vegas gets more humid than Seattle. So like this video if you didn't expect that. Let's just check out Los Angeles and San Diego for a minute. LA is around like 67, 66. San Diego is around 68. So it can actually get a bit humid in these places. Not, not as humid as all of the East, but still getting up there. In the dry region of the West, we have lower humidity, often in the mid 50s. So Salt Lake City, 55. Boise, 55. Bozeman, 56. If you have never lived in a place with a 1% dew point above 70, you do not know how lucky you are. The more humid a location, the more biting insects there tend to be. In Massachusetts and Vermont, I would get countless mosquito and black fly bites every summer, and it can be even worse in the South. Where I live now in Western Washington, I have not gotten a single insect bite all summer. I enjoy the outdoors way more when I'm not being feasted on. There are also fewer cases of tick-borne illnesses like Lyme disease in the Western US in general. To help you further contextualize these 1% dew point values, I'm gonna tell you a number, 60 Fahrenheit or 15 and a half Celsius. What's special about it? Well, ASHRAE recommends that indoor dew points not regularly exceed 60 degrees. So it's a threshold. Why that threshold? Because research shows that persistent indoor dew points above 60 can grow mold and bacteria to a degree that can cause illness. What is the number one factor that impacts indoor humidity? Outdoor humidity. The higher above 60 degrees your location's 1% dew point is, the higher your indoor dew point will tend to rise during those warmer, more humid months. So locations with a 1% dew point of around 70 and above are at a much greater risk of becoming unhealthy from high humidity specifically. Hold on though, if you live in a humid place, you don't need to be scared. Just dehumidify and or condition strategically. And I have videos about both of these that can help you. I also wanna note that there are ways other than humidity that a home can become moldy, such as external leaks from precipitation or internal leaks from plumbing or appliances. So yeah, yeah, understanding humidity is extremely important, not only for comfort, but also for health. So if you're like me, you might be wondering, is it getting more humid over time? I have an answer for you. I conducted an analysis of humidity trends for 26 major US cities from 1970 to 2023. So over 50 years of data. This analysis focused on 1% dew points that I calculated with hourly dew point data from Open Medio. For each city, I applied a Mon Kendall trend test to detect statistically significant trends in humidity and used the Thiel Sen slope to estimate the rate of change in dew point over time. I visualized the results in these interactive charts showing the year by year 1% dew point value along with trend lines and the overall change in dew point for each city. The results, out of the 26 cities analyzed, 18 showed statistically significant increases in the 1% dew point. The remaining eight cities without significance still exhibited nominal increases. So basically, yes, it's definitely getting more humid. This result is not a surprise given that we know the climate is warming. As it warms, water evaporates more readily and humidity increases, it's pretty simple. So I wanna bring your attention to Denver, Colorado, which has a particularly large increase of over three degrees. 
I don't know exactly why that is, but I wonder if it has to do with Denver's proximity to the US moisture line. I mean, maybe that moisture line is like slowly creeping west or something. I don't know. What do you think? Denver is still not very humid though, I have to say. LA also has a large increase, over four degrees. Anybody have any theories about that one? Okay, so I made another map using ASHRAE data that shows you how hot each world location is. And more specifically, it's when a place gets hot, how hot does it get? The darker color is less hot and the lighter color is hotter. Each location shows what's called the 1% cooling dry bulb temperature, which represents the outdoor temperature that's equaled or exceeded during the hottest 1% of the year. So it's relevant during cooling season, AKA summer. Let's battle the UK and the US again, as far as heat waves. Look at how cool the UK is compared to the US. The hottest part of the UK, which is around London, gets above 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 24 to 26 C for 1% of the year. Almost all of the US, including the colder Northern states, get much hotter than that. 88 Pennsylvania, 86 New York, 84 Vermont, look at that. That's not to mention the 110 in Arizona, 100 in California. Let's go to the US only map for better coloration. The coasts are more moderate, as you can see. The hottest part by far is Southern Arizona at just below 110 Fahrenheit. Some of you might be surprised to know that Florida is not nearly the hottest place in the US. It's just super, super humid. That's why people think it's hot. Oh, by the way, it gets hotter in Northern Vermont, 86, than it does in Seattle, 82. So I made another map using ASHRAE data that shows how cold each location is. More specifically, when a place gets cold, how cold does it get? The darker color is colder and the lighter color is less cold. Each location on the map shows what's called the 99% heating dry bulb temperature. For 99% of the year, the temperature will be higher than this value. So only during the coldest 1% of the year will the temperature be lower. This value is relevant in heating season, AKA winter. One thing I find crazy about this map is that the Pacific Northwest and the Deep South have similar cold snaps. What? Yes, the temperature it stays above 99% of the time in Seattle, Washington is around 29 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. In Jackson, Mississippi, it's 28. Again, that doesn't mean that Seattle and Jackson have the same average winter temperature. It means that during the coldest 1% of the time, the temperatures dip to similar levels. Compare that to New England where it dips to 20 to 40 degrees colder and Northern Minnesota at 50 degrees colder. So I made yet another map using ASHRAE data that shows you average annual precipitation amounts, which can be rain, snow, sleet, ice, etc. The darker color is less precipitation and the lighter color is more. And there's a world map on my site as well. This map is similar to the humidity map, but with one exception. The Pacific Northwest coastal marine region gets much more precipitation than the rest of the West. The populated areas get around 40 to 45 inches of precipitation per year. It mostly comes as rain here, not really snow as much. So how does this compare to the East? Well, much of the East gets just as much if not more precipitation with the deep south getting the most. But generally in the east, the days with precipitation are a bit more evenly distributed throughout the year. And in the Pacific Northwest, the majority of them occur in the winter months. Okay, so I made yet another map using ASHRAE data that shows you the average annual all sky solar radiation amount in each location. I'll go over the world version in a bit. The darker color is less sunny and the lighter color is sunnier. This is the amount of solar radiation that reaches the Earth's surface, taking into account cloud cover, air pollution, fog, and other obstructions. So it's a pretty good proxy for understanding how sunny a location is. So what do we see? We see that the North is the least sunny. And in particular, Northwestern Washington and the Northern parts of Maine, Vermont, New York, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota all lack sun to a similar degree. So this area right here. The rest of the Northwest up here, coastal Northeast, Great Lakes states, and this part of the Midwest is slightly sunnier, but not all that much. The South is definitely sunnier with the Southwest being by far the sunniest. I mean, look at this. 
Okay, let's look at the world map for something that was really surprising to me. So the least sunny parts of the contiguous US are actually sunnier than much of Europe. So especially Northern Europe. So the UK, Scandinavia, and even France and Germany. Like this video if that was surprising to you. So much of Europe is very unsunny. Alaska is also pretty unsunny. Next thing, so along this latitude here, it's pretty sunny until you get to central China. Why is that? Well, again, all sky radiation isn't always about cloud cover. Other things can block the sun. For one, central China is inhumanely humid, which blocks some solar radiation, and it also has absurdly high levels of air pollution with thick haze and smog. This is to a degree that most of us have never experienced. And lastly, the Yangtze River Basin can get pretty foggy. And again, you can check my website for all these maps, US climate maps, world climate maps, and US air quality maps, which we'll get to now. So this map shows you how air quality has been over the past 10 years in each major US metro area. More specifically, it's an average of 10 years of median annual air quality index or AQI data. The darker color is better air quality and the lighter color is poorer air quality. In general, an AQI of zero to 50 is considered good, 50 to 100 is moderate, and 101 plus is unhealthy. For the record, I believe zero to 30 is actually good, not zero to 50. Anyway, the coloration is log scaled for easier interpretation, and it uses AQS data from the EPA. The first thing I see is that California has the most unhealthy AQI in the country. Here's why. Wildfires contribute massive amounts of particulate matter. Agricultural pollution, especially in the Central Valley, adds to the problem. In Southern California, high population density leads to significant vehicle emissions, and the state's valleys, which are surrounded by mountains, trap that pollution, and frequent temperature inversions keep polluted air close to the ground. The second thing I notice is that the big cities often have unhealthier AQIs above 50. So New York, Houston, Chicago, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, etc. The third thing I notice is that the Pacific Northwest seems to have the healthiest AQI in the country. Bend and Redmond area is 20. Bremerton, Washington, 17, Olympia, 26, Centralia, 19, Longview, 18, Albany, Oregon, 25. Montana is pretty good too. Here's another AQS data map that shows high pollution events. We see a similar thing here, but notably drier cities like Denver, Salt Lake City, Las Vegas, Phoenix, and most of Central and Southern California have a problem with high pollution events, such as from wildfire smoke. So that's all the maps I created for now. One overarching point I want to make is that there are no perfect locations, at least in the US. Like for example, the Southwest is beautifully sunny with minimal rain, but has absurdly hot summers. California has comfortable temperatures year round and minimal rain, but the air quality is the worst in the country. The Pacific Northwest temperature and humidity are both very comfortable and air quality is generally great, but the winters are very cloudy and rainy. The Rocky Mountain states get less precipitation, low humidity, and more sun, especially in the Southern part, but can get pretty cold in the winter and pretty hot in the summer. The high elevation also bothers some people and air quality can get bad in the Southern section. The Southeast has comfortable temperatures, a fair amount of sun and okay air quality, but humidity is oppressively and inhumanely high and it rains really hard. The Northeast and Midwest have okay air quality, but sun can be lacking, winters can be extremely cold and snowy, and summers are humid, though not as humid as the Southeast. It's up to you to determine which location has a drawback that you can tolerate. Comment below if there are other analyses and maps you want me to make. I definitely want to do a lot more of these in the future, like I want to do a water quality one and a few others. Again, use the link in the description to go to my website, healthyhomeguide.com, if you want to check out these maps yourself. If this video changed the way you think about climate at all, let me know in the comments. Also like this video and subscribe for more content like this. Anyway, thank you for attentively watching.